So my name is Steve Arda. I'm the CEO and founder of Eagle Protect. We started in New Zealand in 2006 and we supply around 80% of that country's primary food industry. And the primary food industry in New Zealand is 50% of the GDP of the country. So it's, it's been a fairly important road. In 2016, we decided to spread out and I brought my family over here to save the US food system initially one glove at a time because it needs it. And so we're, uh, we're five years into our mission and, and starting to, to really uh, get cracking and build up some speed. What I want to talk about today, though, is what I call the food safety gap. Um, some, some areas that we think are particularly dangerous to the food industry and medical ongoing, but food is where we're focused on now. Our testing process we developed as a result of that gap. Why there is a, a gap in the food safety, and that's dirty manufacturing, dirty gloves, fraud, and various other things that have been going on. And you probably know over the last two or three years, the pandemic has really exacerbated that a lot in terms of glove supply and some quality of gloves. And, and we've had conversations with people here today talking about how glove quality has gone downhill. And, and this may explain some of it. And then I want to talk about how to safeguard what matters, which is you, your brand, your team, and your customers. Um, we'll go into that. So the food safety gap. A lot of people don't realise, in fact, most people don't realise that the FDA food compliant doesn't specifically stipulate that gloves need to be clean or intact. But the, the general manufacturing practice for the FDA puts out says that gloves should be intact, clean and in sanitary condition. So that's our gap that we're talking about. So FDA food compliance doesn't mean or require your gloves to be clean or without holes or tears. Now, the other thing is that there's also pretty well unknown as gloves are not checked on arrival in the US at all. Um, so medical gloves sometimes, but generally food gloves just come through. And so there's no check in place. So we're trusting factories in Southeast Asia mostly to do the right thing. So when we got over to the States and we sort of investigated the process of gloves coming into the country and what testing had to be done, we decided it wasn't good enough for our customers to have gloves that came in without checks. And so we set up our own testing process. We um, uh, got a, a, a guy called Barry Michaels, who um, is over in Florida. He's a retired med professor microbiologist. Um, he's been around in this, in this industry for 52 years now. And he's spent the last four or five years developing a test for us, a test process, which I'll go into shortly. Um, but part of that was calibration of, of the testing process using samples of gloves. And that's when the proverbial hit the fan for us. We started this, what we call now the Delta Zero testing program, uh, calibrated over several years. So we tested 2,800 different gloves, 26 brands, both medical and food compliant, um, unused and unopened. Um, and we were a little bit surprised what happened next. 2,800 gloves tested, 69% of them had indicators of feces on the gloves. 46% of the, of the feces were human, um, derived feces. On top of that, we found mold, fungus, uh, E. coli, Listeria, anthrax, Bacillus cereus. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And this is on new and unused gloves coming into the country, both food and medical. So we asked, how on earth can this happen? A lot of it's to do with dirty process. So dirty environment was in the factory, and I've been to factories making gloves all over the world for the last 15 years and I can tell you I've seen some sites having said that there's also some very good factories and they are all improving over time. Contaminated water source um, Southeast Asia generally has poor water quality um, and the, the water has either not been filtered properly on the way through into the system or it's just not been filtered at all. Uh, substandard leach and wash series so Without getting too geeky, the gloves tend to go through seven different wash cycles after they've been formed on the formers. Um, one way of saving money for the factories is to either not have the wash tanks at all or to use cooler water or various other ways of saving money. So um, it means some of these bacteria and pathogens can get through the system and stay on the gloves. And then cross-contamination of packing. One of the favourite stories I tell, the very first glove factory I went to, which I won't mention the country, um, I went into the packing room and it stunk of, of uh, chlorine and acid, it was, it was terrible. And it had open walls, no walls at all, just a roof. And there were piles of gloves being packed manually into boxes by groups of ladies. 
and one person's job was to walk around and, and chew off the cockroaches and the flies off the piles of gloves before they're put into the boxes. Um, that was a long time ago. I haven't said anything like that since. And I, I, again, I say things are improving, um, but there's, there's very little check or balance. The other thing that's happened recently um, as you, over the pandemic, it's, and it's been going on for a long time, but this was one CNN article, and they think there may be 10 times this many gloves having come into the US. But there's 200 million gloves from one bad Thailand uh, person was discovered by the FBI. Uh, the gloves were coming through from China, getting sent down to Thailand, getting repacked into counterfeit boxes and then sent on to the States. And so they've arrived. We've had one of our sales guys turn up at a meat plant and uh, using other gloves than ours. And the guy said, look at this. And there's a big blood smear across the front of the glove. So, and these are going into medical and food, which is a bit of a worry um, as well. That's starting to calm down now, but there's still a lot of these gloves out in the marketplace. The other thing is you'll get a nitrile glove. They'll call it a nitrile, but it's actually something like 70 or 80% vinyl. And without saying bad things about this area, they've got nitrile gloves out there and I can tell from looking at them that they're a blend. So that means people are selling them a, a vinyl glove effectively for a nitrile price. Um, and there's a lot of that goes on. And is there anything wrong with that? I mean, the vinyls aren't as strong. Vinyl gloves also can have micro tears within minutes of wearing because of the cellular structure. So there's potential food safety risks there as well. The other big thing um, that's been going on over the last two or three years, the Customs and Border Patrol in the US has banned now six factories from sending gloves into the US. But they, they get two or three months of a ban and then they have to get re-inspected and, and generally most of them are back online again. But it was a big call in the middle of a pandemic to, to stop these factories from sending gloves into the States. This issue isn't so much about uh, the quality of the glove, but if you've got disgruntled workers who have been forced to work or low wages, are generally not going to do a great job. So there's risk involved in terms of the quality of the glove coming through the system. So what happens next? Well, it's interesting, Sean Stevens, um, who spoke, I think, yesterday, I missed it at the, the mock trial. Um, he's been talking about the FD, FDA have, have woken up like he said, don't feed the bears. So the FDA inspections we've been watching unfold, he said, have gone from three to four days to three to four weeks. And so the chances of, of getting, um, of, of being inspected and finding these problems is, is getting much more aware, I guess, in terms of the FDA. I guess the other thing that gets me is these um, gloves that you're potentially introducing into your food um, processing plant, especially ready to eat foods like this, they potentially are affecting the testing system. So we've got this um, fully cooked pork that's been recalled. I think it's up to 2.3 million pounds now as a, as a subject to recall, but no one's got sick. So it begs the question, where is that um, contamination coming from? I mean, it's potentially from the glove and it could even be the person who's testing is wearing a dirty glove, which is then creating this recall. Really interesting story. When we first started this testing process, we used a number of labs all around the US um, and one of them came back with a contamination on one of our gloves, quite a bad contamination. And we went back to the factory who were dealing with us in Malaysia in this particular case. And they, they said, no, our test samples um, that they keep are perfect. There's no problems. So I went back and long story short, the glove that the testing lab was using to test our gloves was contaminated. So we now make them use sterile gloves. And so I just wonder how much um, else is going on in the system in terms of, of contamination that's not necessarily a food safety risk that's coming in from the glove onto the, onto the product. This is another one. We found, I think, eight to 10 different Bacillus serious types on the gloves. Another recall where 10,000 pounds of pepperoni were recalled. And again, there have been no confirmed reports of adverse reactions. So people aren't getting sick. This is getting tested in the, in the food, coming up in regular testing or, or um, FDA testing. And so the potential is that these recalls are unnecessary. <clears throat> and this is also a pretty interesting story. This is one of our cannabis customers in Washington State. They um, had a, a contamination scare, a chemical, um, an organophosphate carcinogen. It's on the, uh, the Californian uh, Prop 65 list. 
And they tested everything. They couldn't understand where this contaminant had come from. And after several weeks, apparently, of testing, they found it on the gloves. They then sent the gloves out for external testing to validate, and that was where the testing. So the, the, the interesting thing here is, is they were pretty upset because they said, apart from anything else, our staff are wearing these gloves eight hours a day and getting potential carcinogens transferred into the skin. But the other thing that um, it was interesting is that this shouldn't have got through the system. That what the FDA food compliance does do is um, test for chemicals and t chemical migration. So this shouldn't have got through the system. So it sort of again shows that we're relying on factories in Southeast Asia to do the right thing and that the gloves that they're sending are always the same quality and are tested. So how do you safeguard what matters to your business? So the Delta Zero process that we have developed in the testing process is, is sort of the safety net at the bottom of the cliff for us. What really makes the difference is we know exactly what's going on right the way through the, the process. We have what we call single source gloves. When we get a box of gloves, it comes from the same factory every time. We don't use multiple factories for different brands. Uh, we do factory visits. I haven't done one for a couple of years, obviously, but I've visited every factory every year um, for, for the last decade or more. And we know the people really well. We have long standing relationships. We are a B Corp, certified B Corp, um, like Patagonia. So we borrowed their code of conduct and adapted it for our use. We use third party audits, CEDEX, and one of our good customers, Costco, has their audit team over in our factories regularly. Uh, the single source model I mentioned, and we've just started, in fact, our first batch of gloves has come through. We have a, um, a third party uh, app called RFIDA, and they just won an FDA award for transparency. They're used in the food system. We're the only glove company that's um, at this stage has got any traceability. So you can get one of our boxes of gloves, scan a QR code with, with either the app or your camera, and that'll tell you exactly where it's come from, when it came, um, and it has an anti-fraud. So if somebody's, if these gloves aren't authentic, somebody's counterfeited our, our box, then it, it highlights that to us and we can get onto it. Um, it does sound rather silly that people are bothering counterfeiting gloves, but I mean, that seems to be the, the way of the world at the moment, especially when people were paying $20, $30 for a box of gloves. So safe ingredients, we do, this is the process and I can get into a little bit more detail. I'm not a microbiologist, so don't ask me too hard questions. But the ingredients, we do uh, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry so that each glove has a fingerprint. So every time we get the same glove through, we can match it against the original. We do some cross-contamination. We found that, for example, the structure of a vinyl glove is three times, the actual structure of the material of the vinyl glove is three times better at holding on to contamination than a nitrile glove. So if you're using a vinyl glove, you've got three times more chance of, of moving a contamination from one place to the other. So we stopped selling vinyl gloves five or six years ago for that reason and others. Cleanliness, we do pathogen testing, micro, microbial analysis, um, using various um, methods that Barry's developed. We did the typical structural integrity um, stuff, strengths, the acceptable quality level of holes and so on. And then we do a dermal compatibility. And that was interesting. We used mouse embryo and human sperm for that. And that came from an IVF um, professor in Germany who noticed that some of the sperm motility that she was um, playing around with, for want of a better term, um, was, was affected by the gloves that weren't even touching the sperm. They were just in the vicinity. So there's something going on there in terms of dermal toxicity. And we don't think it's, we, we need to check these things. We don't want people wearing these for eight hours a day and getting some sort of um, toxic effect from them. Thank you, that's me. I'm happy to answer some questions, if you have any, or comments, thoughts. Hi. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, you, you want the a copy of the study? Yeah. yeah. So that's actually something I should have mentioned. So Barry's presented our work to date at the International Association for Food Protection Conference for the last three years, well, four years plus a virtual, um, and we're presenting again this year in July, I think it is, in Pittsburgh. But we're also getting it published in the Journal of Food Protection in the next few months. We're waiting; it's been peer reviewed, and so we happy to send it. I mean, we can we have. Um, uh, data to give you now in terms of general information, but the actual process and everything 
Um, we'll come out then. Any other questions? Are there any experiences of, of some of this stuff we're talking about? We spoke to a couple of people yesterday that had, um, I think they said five out of 10 gloves were ripping. Um, is that sort of happening with you guys? So, sorry, I can't hear you. Really. I said, I think, I think one of the learnings is this isn't usually something we look towards first when we look for. Sorry, um, I said, I think this isn't something that we normally look for first when we're evaluating these type of situations. So it's eye-opening that the problem starts at manufacturing or receiving into the plant because we don't normally test the gloves when they come in. So uh, the, that's why we, I, I guess we've gone right back to the factories to get this process right and our testing is really just to validate the fact that everything we're doing before then is working. Um, one of the things that sort of astounds me is is that people, gloves are uh, defined by the FDA as a utensil, which is a, is a zone one food safety item, yet it's the one thing that often isn't tested um, regularly. I know a lot of people do test them, swab them, but I mean, it's often not tested at all. And it's just, it's almost, and we get the comments so often, I've never thought of that. I've never thought the gloves could be a problem. But sort of, we think they're, because they come out of a box, we think they're um, sort of magically clean. And, and, it, and the other thing, I mean, they're not required to be clean. So there's no one doing anything wrong by bringing in a dirty glove as, as far as the FDA food compliance is concerned. Yeah, I just have more of a comment. So to go along with what you were just saying, um, we do swab our gloves and they fell miserably. I would recommend people just do that to check it out because it is zone one. There is no um, regulatory things out there to control it. So we have to you know, put in things in place like what you guys are doing with the testing and such. Um, and I know from my own experience, and I talked to this young lady yesterday about it, is we've had gloves come in and you know it had a cigarette button in it in the box in the closed sealed box obviously it was from another country because of different wording but yep. that the, they are not kept in a sanitary way whenever they're making them right. and that's that's just it i guess that's that that's thank you i guess that's the point is is there is no requirement for them to be clean i'm sure they're not supposed to have cigarette butts in them um, um, although that's not specified the fda um, title 21 does say at the very bottom after listing chemicals for five or six pages, that gloves should be thoroughly washed before use. Um, it doesn't state that they need to be clean or any of those things, but I don't know anybody very much that goes and washes their gloves before they use them. It could, it's a bit ambiguous. It could mean they should be thoroughly washed at the factory before use, but the trouble with that is that the factory is using dirty water to wash the gloves in many cases, so there's nothing really been achieved by that. I think you briefly touched upon this in the beginning, but do you also uh, find this with the exam rated gloves and medical graded gloves as well too? Sorry, so a lot of the findings when it comes to uh, what you guys have found on a lot of the food graded gloves, are you finding this uh, as well as on the medical graded gloves that are coming over from overseas? So, sorry, I, there's a fan or something going here, which it's hard to hear. Um, yeah, the some of the 26 brands and i can't offhand i think it was about six but i can't remember were medical examination gloves and so they are and we, we don't we, in new zealand our business sells into medical we don't do medical here very much just yet so we haven't focused on it but hospital acquired infections are one of the leading cause of illness and death around the world in fact new zealand for all its beauty and cleverness um, is, is pretty much the worst in the oecd for this and our typical government departments, and I'm sorry, um, anyone in New Zealand who might listen to this one day, they're, they're focused, or like most procurement people, they're focused on price. And so they just get a cheaper glove. And there's lots of ways gloves can be cheap. Next time you get a box of gloves in, for example, count them, because it's a common thing to put 95 gloves in a box of 100 with some factories, not good factories. It's common to put 25% chalk in, uh, in the glove mix to make it cheaper, but it makes them rip and, and not 
necessarily food safe or medical safe and lots of other things that people can do to make the gloves cheaper. So generally you get what you pay for, like most things. Um, and so it's just getting, and you know, it's one of our big customers. We told them they were probably losing 10 to 15% of their gloves through ripping and, and not being able to be worn. They did a test in six of their locations. They were losing up to 25% of their gloves, so they couldn't even wear them. And so there's two things there. One is the food safety process gets broken because the, the, the wearer is supposed to go back to the station, wash his hands, dry them, put gloves on. They invariably don't. In fact, one of the supervisors just had a pile of gloves in her pocket. So every time they ripped, they just... So food safety... So this is also improving their process and, as well as you know, having a better glove. And it's just... it's. Better ingredients, better process makes a better glove. It's pretty simple. Thank you very much.